Hi everyone, I'm Dave Feldman. I'm here today with Salil Zaveri so that you can better get to know him and perhaps do business with him. It's great to see you again, Salil. And um, uh, Okay, you're gonna go into why are you inviting me to be on this video? And that's it. Okay, you know that what, Let's, your... let me start from there because sure. I, can, I can knit this together. Okay. Uh, Saliel, why did you want to have me in this video? David, um, the points that I'm going to explain about myself are not necessarily going to be presented as clearly as I would hope by me. And I'm hoping as I explain it to you about my background and my strengths and some of the mistakes I've made that I don't want people to make is if you understand it, that hopefully they'll understand. Oh, it. I see. Perspective. I, perspective. Have, I have the perspective of a, a fresh pair of eyes, kind of. Correct. And if you. I don't come clearly in my explanation to you, then you will dig deeper and make sure I do. I understand. Okay, very good. Well, I see that we're starting with the number 40, and I, th I think that's about 40 years. Is that what we're talking about? Yes. Yeah, so in my outline, I have mentioned 40 years, and what that is is my dad brought me into the insurance business in 1978. He started in 1969. And the wow. goal of today, of this video, is really to help people understand who I am, some of the misconceptions of what my competitors might say to gain their business, and what the other carriers, insurance companies, will say to gain their business. So I'm going to expose not just myself of who I am, but I'm going to expose my competitors, the insurance industry, and so all of you can make better choices. Excellent, excellent. Well, I see, um, starting with, uh, I guess, the lessons that you've taught, uh, as you've also learned lessons, but we're gonna start with the lessons taught, and we start with uh, Northwestern Mutual, is that correct? Yes, so I started at Northwestern Mutual, and good company back then. Mm -hmm. They had a great dividend history. My dad chose that company because they spent very little, so if they spend less, the clients get more dividends. But unfortunately, after I joined them a few years later, they added a new feature to keep people from borrowing. So when I first started selling Northwestern, the goal was to help people build cash value that they can use towards their retirement and along the way perhaps for a home or their kid's college mm -hmm. sure. or business opportunity. That's what it's there for in a way. That's what the cash value is supposed to be doing. Yeah. And if cash value was not important, then they would have bought a different product. But Northwestern decided along the way that it would be better for them if people didn't take the money out for the okay. company. Okay. And to discourage people from taking it out, they added a feature that they hoped clients would amend into called direct recognition. And what that meant is if I had projected to you that your cash value would reach $3 million at retirement, that would be only if you don't touch the money along the way. So it would be like wow. saying that you're going to get 40 miles to the gallon on your car as long as you drive it at 4 miles per hour. That's not realistic. Not realistic, no. It was a great product, but they tinkered with it and they ruined it in my opinion because direct recognition does not allow clients to use money while they're alive. Okay. If they use it while they're alive, the cash value will drop drastically. Okay. And the change that you made, uh, you went somewhere where that was not the case. I went to a company that decided not to introduce direct recognition to their clients. Wow. So whoever I sold at Northwestern was not purchasing with direct recognition, but if I sold anybody new, they would have to buy it with direct recognition, which was forced on them. Yeah. Okay. And the new clients, I was sure that I didn't want them locked in. The old clients, I explained to them that they could do a 1035 exchange and move. So here's the misconception. People tend to cancel old policies and move to new policies. And they lose in a move, unless it's done the right way. My competitors go out there and they say, cancel that and buy this. So that creates a brand new commission for the agent. It creates a loss for the client. Mm. That's not the way to do it. Things change, and over the 40 years, insurance companies have reduced premiums, 
over 20 times. People are living longer. And if people are living longer, they should move to a rate that's lower. For example, when we started with cell phones, you remember we were paying 50 cents a minute? Yeah. And we used to tell people, I'll call you from a landline. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, today, we don't say we'll call you from a landline. We just finish the conversation. We don't have to. We don't have to. Right. Rates went down. That's Technology right. improved. Rates went down. Things changed. Same thing happened in the insurance industry. When I started in 1978, people were going to live to their 60s. Now they're living into their late 80s. So insurance companies in these past 40 years have reduced the rates over and over. So if somebody bought that whole life policy back then and held on to it, they would actually be paying like they would on a cell phone at 50 cents a minute. Hmm. And some of them probably are. And many of them are thinking that they locked in their age see, yeah. back then. Right. That's not how it should work. The way it should work is you should take that asset that you bought, that life insurance policy, take the cash value and do a comparison to what's available today. And if what's available today is less expensive and the cash value can be credited dollar for dollar without losing that money, I see. you can gain both. You can get more debt benefit for the same premium that you're paying on the old policy. You can get the cash value to roll over at possibly a better rate of return, enhancing your cash value growth, get more debt benefit, more cash value for the same money, or get a premium reduction. And that's the idea. The idea is to be in touch with the client and not be loyal to the company. My loyalty was not to Northwestern Mutual. My loyalty is always to the client. As a matter of fact, the next topic on that bullet point was MET. So when I went to MetLife... In that must have hurt you, though, moving it. It was good for the customers, and God bless you, it's terrific. But it couldn't have been good for you to make that move. No, I lost all my residuals at Northwestern uh, by moving. Yeah. Now, all the other Northwestern guys stayed on. They stayed on because they wanted to keep their residuals. And they will it's say to the client, them. well, it's good for them, you know, people don't like change. Many people I know have always stayed at the companies I joined because they like their pension plan to build up. They like their residuals to build up. Sure. I don't think about the residuals or my pension plan. I think about what I'm selling the client as, is it the best and if it becomes not as good as something that's better, I will do a 1035 exchange, move them to the new carrier, getting them the lower premium or the higher benefit without losing cash value. So in a way, you're looking at the client's big picture as opposed to, well, this would be good for the client today and it'd be great for me today, uh, me being you. Um, uh, in, but in this sense, you're looking at the client's long-term situation and factoring in whatever has changed. Yeah, we always do comparisons of what's better for them. And just like your car insurance, if the premiums go down with another carrier, you'd move them there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if I were thinking of only me, I would say, listen, the company's good, keep it there, keep it there, keep it there, and keep my residuals. Okay. And that's not the way it should be. It should always be about the client. Even if I lose residuals, if I lost residuals at Northwestern by moving away from the company. I lost residuals when I left MetLife in 1999. So I was there for 10 years and I left them as well because they decided to demutualize. So if you have a whole life policy, you want all the dividends. You don't want stockholders to take your dividends. So what happened is when MetLife in 1988 said to me, we're not going to introduce direct recognition, I went there. Mm -hmm. I see. And then when they decided to demutualize, I left them because if you're going to write a whole life policy, you cannot write it with a carrier that's stock. And they were demutualizing, which means that now the policyholders will get some of the dividends and the stockholders will get some of the dividends. So you have a partner that's going to take money from your rate of return. I see. And so by me leaving Met, again, I lost my residuals. That's now 20 years in the business. Wow. Almost 10 at Northwestern, losing money, residuals. Losing again at MetLife, losing residuals. And the important thing is I was able to go back to the clients and again do a 1035 exchange in their best interest. So if they get more for the money, then they move. If they like staying where they are, we show comparison, then we leave them there. 
It's always about comparing regularly, keeping them up to date with cash values, dividend scales, rates of return, premiums, doing a full analysis. Excellent. And all exchanges that are ever done are done by a New York State Regulation 60, which means the New York State Insurance Department gets to look at it, what I'm proposing. The client looks at it. The previous company looks at it. So there's oversight. It's complete oversight, full disclosure. I see. And their accountant can look at it, their attorney can look at it. And then when I prove my point that it's better to make the change, I lost money in moving. And they will not lose money in moving. In their case, they will move for the gain. I lose residuals, but they gain in moving. And I guess in, in a way, even though, yes, if you look at it in, in a narrow sense, as some people might, you lost money, but in the big picture, you're doing a better job for people, and that's a good thing. Yeah, ultimately, it's about referrals. If I do the right thing by David Feldman and everyone else, then they'll refer clients. Of course. And the worst thing an agent or anybody else can do to them is sell them, forget them, or get out of the business, and now the client is spending for themselves. They're assigned to another agent who doesn't even care about them, just wants to sell them more insurance, and we'll tell them to cancel the old and buy a new without the 1035 exchange, mm. without doing mm. what's in the best interest of the client. Okay. So for me, it's always about doing the right thing, even if I lose residuals, even if I lose my pension. So where did you go then? Uh, well, then I became independent, essentially, which is what I am. Now I've been 40 years in the business, mm -hmm. and I will continue to work through my specialists, I have people in the business that I partner with and you know there are issues that sometimes we can't always do the best. Clients come to me and they say I have this, I have that and I say stay where you are. It's the best. I would love to make a commission but where you are is already good so I don't want to steal the business from your current agent or broker. If it's going to hurt them. If it's going to hurt them I'm not going to move them. Right. And if it's the same, if I could do the same thing that's already been done, then I don't want to hurt the previous agent or broker. I want that previous agent or broker to benefit. They're already doing a good job. They did job. it the right way. Okay. So why rock the boat if it's done correctly? Okay. Okay. Um, so, um, so I'm going to kind of... The next on the topic is VUL. And VUL means variable universal life. So what I would that? tell all of you who may have gotten that product, Variable Universal Life, is don't do it. I was licensed for that product back in 1988, and uh, since 78, 79, somewhere back then when Northwestern Mutual and MetLife wanted to sell mutual funds, I never sold any mutual funds to anybody, even though insurance companies kept telling me, Salil, you're losing out revenue and not cross-selling people, mutual funds, variable universal what that means is investing in the market mm -hmm. at risk mm -hmm. uh, if you buy a policy from me and if the market goes up it goes up but if it goes down you lose all me. your cash value you can lose 100 percent of your cash value wow. and i don't think insurance products should be gambled with if you want to gamble you go gamble at atlantic city you gamble on bitcoin you gamble in mutual funds but you don't gamble with your life insurance cash value. Sure. And people who bought variable universal life have gotten hurt over the years many, 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 many times. Wow. And I don't recommend that. So for those of you who have VUL, talk to us and understand your options. Next on the topic is index universal life. Index universal life is a product that you can be in the market without losing. And it follows a market index? It follows a market index, but you have a floor. The floor could be with some companies zero, some companies 1%. What that means is the market crashes, they take the loss. The insurance company will take the whole loss. Well, so let's say it's 1% and, and the market goes down a lot, 40%. What, what does the 1% mean? It means your cash value will earn at least 1%. You don't lose the minus 40. If you were in a VUL, you would have lost all your money by 40% or more. In this case, the insurance company will give you 1% on your money rather than taking a loss of 40%. So you'll still gain 1%. You'll still gain 1%. You'll have your principal or whatever it was plus 1%. Plus 1%. And, but there's a downside. What is the it? The downside is there's a ceiling. The ceiling might be 13. 
So they might say to you that, look, when the market goes up 40 points, we're only going to give you 13. Yeah, we're taking a risk. I don't see any downside in taking 13 when the market's 40 because 13, what's wrong with 13? There's no tax on the 13 if you do it correctly. I see. So 13 non-taxable to me is great. You're getting a kind of a guarantee there, a hedge yeah. against now the market. You, and now if you back. bought a whole life policy, you'd be making 4 or 5 or 6%. So 13 is a lot better than 4 or 5 or 6 on the and upside. We're saying if the market went up 40, you'd, you would have been making 4 or 5 in the whole life. The whole life. You'd be yeah. missing out the boat completely. I see. But here, here you're getting in, your 13. In that universal life, you'll make the 13 as opposed to on the downside, you'll make 1. So mm -hmm. the down is 1, up is 13. And to be in that span is better. Thirteen is pretty good. Then to be in a whole life policy making four or five percent all the time, yep. that's too much of a guarantee. Right. It's right. too safe. Sure. How are you going to build up any cash value at four or five? Yep. I understand. Okay. So the next thing I want to touch on is long-term care. A lot of people out there are unaware that they can actually have long-term care within their life insurance. There are benefits for doing it that way. The first benefit is by adding the rider, long-term care rider to your life insurance. Let's use an example. Let's say you and your wife bought a million dollar life insurance policy and today you don't need it for the same reasons. Today your reasons may be different. You may be looking out for yourself in your old age. Mm -hmm. Previously you might have been concerned to leave it for your kids, for your wife to pay off mortgage. Sure. Today you may not have the mortgage obligation. Your kids may have grown up. And many people are thinking of selling their life insurance policy out there in the open market. There are ads on television saying if you don't need the policy, yeah. they'll buy it from you. But they're going to buy that policy for a fraction of your cash value and that benefit. Yeah. You're going to take a big loss. Instead of that, you can get 100% of the value by just putting a rider on your policy called long-term care rider. Now, so that million dollars will be paid to you in your old age, the death benefit, not the cash value. So let's use an example. Let's say your cash value is 200,000 when you're 60. And let's say your death benefit was a million. Now, if you call the insurance company and say, send me my cash value because I'm ill, they'll send you the 200,000 and charge you interest at probably five to 8%. Instead of that, you can have the rider on the policy and say, send me the death benefit, I'm ill. And they'll send you the death benefit while you're alive, mm -hmm. taking the entire million while you're alive, tax-free. Oh, wow, what a difference. Big difference. Big difference. You can get a million dollars instead of $200,000. And people are focused on the cash value when they should be focused on taking the death benefit without dying. And this is a long-term care rider. Rider. Now, you can't do it correctly with every carrier. A lot of carriers have a lot of fine print that says you can't do that, and if you could do that, there's a catch. So you need to speak to an independent broker who can explain to you. I was just going to say, you're in a position to help the client navigate, navigate those waters. Navigate the process. I see. Very interesting. I can show them their current policy, how they can modify it, to get the death benefit while they're alive. Tax-free, interest-free, loan-free. And people don't realize what a difference that makes in the quality of their life. That could make, that could be zero to 100% quality of life difference. Yeah, instead of going and using up your own assets while you're alive. If you even, you know, have, who knows how what your assets will look like. Yeah, and just to have wow. that million dollars of death benefit sure. available tax-free without dying. That makes a big difference. If you right. Now, if they went out and bought a regular long-term care policy, they would not get cash. They would only get reimbursement towards a nurse or a nursing home. This million dollars on the life insurance rider comes as cash, if done correctly. If you do it with the wrong companies, it's going to come as a reimbursement. If you do it with the right companies without the fine print, it's going to come as cash. Again, big difference. Yeah. Big difference. So knowing the differences, it's not all the same. Company by company. Some companies won't give you the cash. Some companies will expect you to have certain conditions. So you don't want to have all this discovery at time of claim. Sure. And I guess as, as you get to know the client's life and un to understand all of these details, 
Um, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Um, so just as the client or the potential client here in our audience is getting to know you, you get to know them when you talk about all of these things and you learn about their life and about uh, whatever product they may have bought into so that you can really see and make the, uh, help them make, to make the best decisions and guide yes. them. Yes. Now, I don't sell anymore. I don't go and see the clients or present the product that way. I have conceptually helped clients understand what I have done, what I would do. I have agents now and brokers that I partner with mm -hmm. that go out and do the actual license work, present the product, do the application, do the servicing. I'm at a different stage in my life. I spend time in Puerto Rico, I spend time in New York, spend time visiting friends and family all over the country. But these things are still done, and they're done by people that you personally have vetted. Correct, correct. I vet them, I know what they do, and I'm only a consultant now to those agents and brokers. And this wealth of knowledge that you've built up in these 40 years is still kind of at the beck and call of the agents and brokers and therefore at the client. Correct. The agents and brokers can understand from me what they should be doing. They probably know. And the clients can call me as a friend, as a just an advocate as to what am I doing, what should they be doing, not from a licensed agent perspective, mm -hmm. but from a peer. Very so good. now, although I benefit though, on full disclosure, I do earn consulting fees for doing what I do in the industry, mm -hmm. but I don't act as a licensed agent like an AXA or a MetLife or a New York Life agent would. Okay. I'm simply a consultant now on a peer level to the people out there. Okay, very good. Um, so what's next? Well, what's next is uh, some of the things that people need to understand is how agents defer from a broker okay a lot of agents out there are going to say I could sell you everything a lot of bankers are gonna to try to sell you insurance a lot of stockbrokers are gonna to try to sell you insurance I know. everybody wants to cross sell they want to not only make money in what they do but they want to try to do banking insurance and investments and call themselves financial advisors. Because they figure they have the relationship and they... But, so it's like saying that is your dentist going to do a new surgery, knee surgery because you're already there. Because you're like your dentist. Well, you're, I like my dentist. He yeah. should work on my heart. You're in their chair, you know. You might as well while point. you're there fix your knee. It's a good way of looking at it. Or fix your ear. Yeah, no, thank but you. But the problem is that how many procedures have they done? So has a stockbroker done 40 years of insurance selling? to see how insurance companies change. All the fine print, are they reading it? Or are they just referring it to some guy in their organization that didn't really even know the client and now are being brought in just from that perspective? So I would prefer personally that a client deal with a insurance person that does insurance, call a stock broker to do stocks, call a banker to do banking. That's me, personally. And I think that's everybody, really. Once they think of it that way, once they realize that, I think people, look, they, they figure that whoever they're talking to means well, and they, I'm sure they mean well, but they are also many people uh, who are trying to sell insurance who might not be qualified in terms of the details and the depth of knowledge and experience that you have. They uh, might, those people might be acting very much for themselves for the client to a degree, but really also for themselves. That's why they're doing this. So uh, in dealing with someone who does this and nothing but this, I'm going to my knee surgeon for my knee. And that's what I would recommend because although the stockbroker can sell you insurance, you know, they are not necessarily going to have knowledge of insurance the way they've not filed claims for 40 years, right. they've not done underwriting for 40 years, but they will get commission from you for selling you insurance. And many people out there are using the word financial advisor loosely. Now, if they're so brilliant, why are they still out there selling? Now, I'm not brilliant financial advisor. I've lost a lot of money over the years in investing in the wrong things. But on insurance... But you're not selling people stocks. Yeah, I'm not suggesting stocks. 
I'm not suggesting mutual funds. Right. I'm not suggesting suge su uh, suggesting financial advice because I'm no genius in that area. I've lost money in deals, so I would rather just be the insurance guy. Sure. Let them help help them understand what policies to buy, what companies to deal with, when to move from one company to the next when the opportunity arises. Not be the financial advisor because I'm not the guru in that area. So people who say they're financial advisors, you know, I would suggest to the client that deal with somebody who's a specialist in their area, not somebody, okay. somebody trying to cross sell. That makes everything. a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, so where are we going next? Well, I started a new project I want to tell you about now tell that I'm in it. Puerto Rico. Okay. Now that I'm in Puerto Rico and I have this experience in selling, experience in I had built an agency. I don't know if I mentioned that. I would started an that. agency from scratch for one of the major insurance carriers. And wait, wait, I'm hearing this plane. Wait a second. We'll, we'll go back and we'll talk about the new project. Okay. Now, tell me, just tell me, where are we on this? We have covered the right side. Yeah. And, and now you're starting transitioning yeah. to some of the bottom stuff. I we're think. we're getting into this ZC right here. Is it that's very, consulting? Yeah. Yeah. But um, let, let's go to the learn part, actually. I shouldn't jump there either. So it's just as well okay. that we go okay, and we'll get back to that. some of the lessons learned. So, so let's, let me start with that. So along the way, in, in your 40 years, you must have learned some valuable lessons. Tell me about that. I did. Uh, for example, I know that we have regulatory agencies in the insurance department for many, many, many years I've been filling out my license renewal application every two years. So in 40 years I filled it out 20 times. And I had made certain mistakes. Uh, in 1998 I had gone through a financial crunch because I went and built a scratch agency for an insurance company. And in taking it from scratch, which means with no agents, to building it up, I lost personal money while I was building it. And instead of firing the managers that I had to not lose money, I decided to take a personal hit and lose my own money rather than my team to lose money. Wow. In doing that, I disclosed to the insurance department back in 1998 that I had gone through the financial hardship of that, not that I don't do what I do well, I did it fantastically. I built the agency from 1200th in the company to 25th. And wow. I took it where it's supposed to go. My people became successful. Our agency became successful. The company benefited from my guidance in leading these people. But I took a personal hit rather than make people take a hit. And I told the insurance department that. And they said, oh, sure, let us know what the details are. So I told my attorney to send them the details of my financial loss, which was not business related. It was personal. And the insurance department didn't get it in time. So what do they do? It's like when you have a speeding ticket and you don't show up to court, uh, they revoke like your that. license. Uh, so I got a license revocation in 1998 because they didn't get the details in time. So I called the insurance department and I said, I'm sorry my attorney didn't send it in time. I will personally bring it to you up to Albany. I got in my car, brought it, handed it, and they reinstated my license without any fine, without any penalties, oh, good. and unrevoked my license. Said, thank you. You're the one that told us about your financial. You're the one that brought us the details. So they now. realized what went on. Once they realized that, they reinstated you. They realized that the attorney didn't send them what they had asked. It was timing. It was a timing issue. Yeah. It wasn't what I didn't tell them. And when I handed it to them, they said, you did nothing wrong. You told us about it in time. You brought us the mm -hmm. details mm -hmm. after the fact when it was revoked. And we'll unrevoke your license. And you learned from this. And I learned from that. So I have to watch for myself. Don't let somebody else handle 
details on your behalf. And stay on top of everything, the timing and everything, the post yeah, office yeah. even. Yeah, you, you don't want to fool around with the regulatory agencies. Sure, of course. So I learned from that. Now, my competitors probably ran around back in 1998 and said something like, oh, his license was revoked, you know, maybe he stole from a client or maybe he stole from the company. So this is where disclosure, you know, me telling the insurance department everything paid off, being honest, mm -hmm. being upfront, but agents to compete with me would have twisted the facts. Sure. And that happens. And I've been told by clients. Clients have called me and said, you know, this guy or that guy who's also in the business said your license was revoked and you might have done this or that. And I said, look, my financial difficulties were from me building a scratch agency into a successful agency. Any business owner may see financial hardship on its way up. But I took it up and I built it up. And they won't say that. My competitors won't say that he did that financial yeah. loss as a they, person. They sacrifice. tell the first part of the story, but not the whole story yeah. and not the happy ending for sure. Yeah, the happy ending was that we made a successful office mm -hmm. by taking a financial hit personally. Yeah. You know, and disclosing everything. And the revocation was nothing that was illegal on my part. And the ongoing benefit is that you learn from it and you're better off and you're better able to serve people. Yeah, so I did. And the other lesson was more recently. So again, the financial disclosure, I have an issue with one of the insurance companies that says to me that I owe them money. They actually owe me 100,000 and they said I owe them 8,000. So their attorney, without checking with the other department, went and got a judgment against me. Yeah. Now this is what happens in a big company. The left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Now, I'm in the process of getting that judgment reversed, but the insurance department comes to me and says, hey, you didn't tell us about this. I did tell them about it. I they don't them, know that you told, they don't know that they know that. <laughs> yeah, they don't know. Again, you have two lawyers. You yeah. have a lawyer in the insurance department that says, oh, you didn't tell us. And you have records from 2004, 2006, 2008, and they don't want to go and dig it out. So now I have to go through the state of New York to have that regulatory issue looked at and when they look at it they're gonna say yes you did tell us and the fact that we are penalizing you now so they said to me that just pay us forty five hundred dollars and that's okay you can keep your license I said no I said I will not allow you to tarnish my name to say I'm untrustworthy that I didn't tell you about this it's more important to me it's not the $4,500 fine. Matter of fact, another department from the insurance, depart insurance department said, oh, pay just $250. I said, I won't do it. I won't pay $250. I won't pay you $4,500. And I won't admit to the fact that I did not disclose this to you. So the truth should come out. The truth the should idea. come out. Yeah, I will pursue it. So sometimes you learn a lesson yeah. that keep copies of everything and pursue it. Because departments are going to be losing data then only you can defend yourself. And I will. Then there'll be an update on that in the future. Okay. But in the meantime, okay. a lesson to be learned is don't trust one department because the department screws up. You have to always protect yourself. And don't always take the quick fix, even though they say, well, we'll fix it, but pay us this, but there's going to be a blemish on your record. To pay $250, to, to go from 4500 and pay 250 and agree, it still looks like I was wrong. I wasn't wrong, and I will prove that part. Very but good. the agents out there in the insurance industry will take that data and turn it around and say, oh, look, you know, he got a judgment from an insurance company. Well, the insurance company is going to have a punitive damage from that false claim. Mm -hmm. The insurance department does a great job. They stop agents who are criminals. They stop agents who are doing the wrong thing, and that's good. But when they have bad information, they might stop people who are good. Yeah, I, I am going to get dragged into something because of misinformation that they're dealing with within their department. As a matter of fact, when I said, look at the records of those years when I disclosed it, they sure. said, we don't have those records anymore. Yeah, yeah. So if you don't have those records, how do you blame me for something? Well, with the truth, you will climb back out. Well, it's not even a concern for me because I will not admit to anything that they claim wrongfully. Okay. What are some of the other lessons you've learned? Some of the other lessons are, you know, uh, I have 
learn what not to do. Okay, like what? Along the way, we all want to invest. You know, doctors want to invest in restaurants because they have so much money, or somebody else has money and they mm -hmm. want to invest in something else. I invested in an internet business. In the dot-com boom, I thought, okay, I can be a millionaire too. And I started something called allthestores.com. Big mistake. I'm an insurance guy. I'm a face-to-face -face people person. The only way I can do what I do well is to be with someone. I'm not, I don't even know what to buy online. If I go online, I'm going to overpay. But you have to have these experiences sometimes and learn that I should do what I'm great at. Yeah. So I thought I would start a trucking company with 50 trucks running around. I thought I would have an internet business. So those were my side things I did along the way. And... Of course, I stayed in insurance. I continued to partner with all the agents and do what I do, the consulting side. Mm -hmm. But my side investments lost money. So I'm not a good advisor. When didn't it hurt your to... clients, though. You didn't no, hurt your insurance it clients. Yeah, never. It was just no. something you did something and you tried. Something I did. Something I did, something I tried, and I didn't do it right, and I lost no, money. But you learned from it. I learned from and it. And you know what? The people that, you know, I know that you help a lot of people, and, and the, those some of those people would benefit by hearing you say, you know, I tried something and it wasn't the right fit for me. And they could hear that and say, you know, maybe I shouldn't try something that's not the right fit for me. Because I know you help people in other areas of business. Which yeah, we'll get to. I focus, so, you know, my DNA, my DNA is to be a face-to-face -face person. Mm -hmm. I can sell, I can guide teach. people, I can teach agents, I can show business owners how to take their business to the next level by building a sales force, like I did from scratch and took it from 1200th in the company to 25th. And had I stayed, maybe one, but I left them, they demutualized, I didn't want to stay on. But, you know, we did such rapid growth doing it the right way. And that's my strength. My strength is selling, my strength is teaching, my strength is understanding insurance, my strength is not internet space where I got involved in, my strength is not transportation industry which I got involved in, on investment side, and I lost money. But you learned. It affected my marriage. Really? Yeah. I mean, to lose that kind of money, my wife back then, we got divorced a few years ago, but it affected my life. You know, bad investments. Oh, it's got to be hard. Yeah. She was a great gal. You know, she's an amazing person, and even today we're friends. And wow. I was fortunate. I was fortunate that, you know, we stayed on together. We stayed committed to the children. We didn't divorce on those grounds wow, back good then. For you. We waited for the kids to grow beyond 21. And then I moved to Puerto Rico when, after she had enough of my <laughs> ventures, when she saw that I was doing transportation, I was doing internet, she said, Look, you're crazy enough to do all those things. Please don't put me through the heartaches. I said, Okay. Wow. Have a long life. I'll figure it out on my own. You know, and I did meet someone wonderful now good. in Puerto Rico since I moved there. Oh, good. And that brings up the topic of my venture that I started now. Yes, tell me and I want that. everybody to be aware that in addition to utilizing me for the insurance conversations they may want to have, they could talk to me about if they have a sales organization and they want to take that sales organization to the next level, I can help them build it. So let's use an example. Let's say that you want to take your business and you have not closed certain deals out there that they, you presented. You can utilize me to go in and present that on your behalf. I can be a hired presenter for you to close deals that didn't close. No kidding. You can hire me to come in and teach your salespeople how to close more deals because it's about a logical step-by-step -step process of prospecting and finding the right markets, presenting to those people a certain way, following up a certain way. There are many steps to a sales process. And I can be a sales coach to a sales organization mm -hmm. or just a single business deal that needs to be closed. I see. I might even be able to close something that's worth millions, you know, and you're just waiting on it to happen. Eventually it may. But instead of waiting for the eventual, I can make it happen today, possibly. So I guess just as 
selling insurance and understanding the insurance industry and how it's grown and changed and, and morphed over the years is part of your DNA. Selling itself is a part of your DNA and you can share that uh, with the folks out there, perhaps with myself and, and uh, with whomever, so that they will prosper more as well. Yeah, it doesn't matter what industry they're in. If a hospital is trying to merge with another hospital and the deal is not happening, I can sit in on that and make that deal happen. Maybe I can resolve the Israel-Palestine issue. Nobody's called me. To Who happen. knows? You know, it's they about, haven't tried you yet. It's, it's about skills. Skills for bringing people together. Yeah. I brought insurance companies and insurance clients together. I brought insurance companies and insurance agents together. You know, I'm able to understand the clear picture and see what's missing. And you're not emotionally involved with the issue, so I think I would think that's an advantage. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I can look at the facts on both sides, you know, and help people close deals. I can help them take their sales to another level, and that's Zaveri Consulting. We started that just recently. How would people find that? Uh, ZaveriConsulting.com. Oh, okay. To go very to that good. website. Mm -hmm. It's a very simple page. It's just me. They don't get a whole company. They get me to help them close deals. And I can do that in addition to guiding them on the insurance world. Wow. That's amazing. And and you're living in Puerto Rico and, and have a new love in your life and, and um, all good things. Yeah. May, may you um, have many more. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really blessed that you know my mom and dad with their unique personalities... Uh, I don't know if I mentioned my mom was in the business too. No, I didn't know that. I knew your dad was, but I didn't know your mom was. Yeah, my dad uh, started in 69. My mom came in the business a couple of years later. And they have unique strengths, each of them. And I was able to learn that. So I'm able to see things when I sit with people, what their issues are. Mm -hmm. You know, it's always about what does the other person want and need. And me as a salesperson, I have to make sure I address that. Not address my needs or what the insurance company wants. Or if I'm selling on your behalf to a client, not what you want. I want to make sure the client gets what they want. And I have to see it from your side also. So my skills that come to me from my mom and dad, my interactions with hundreds and hundreds of people who are my clients over the years, the people I saw in the internet space where I lost money, but I learned from them. From the transportation industry, I learned from them. So my experience comes from 40 years where we began in the beginning of this video that I started in the insurance business 40 years ago. That 40 years of experience in insurance, understanding people, understanding sales, sales management, all of that comes together and maybe my next 40 weeks or 40 years, God willing, God willing, is going to help me help others sell, whether they have insurance in mind or have other thoughts in mind. And I look forward to working with you and all of them and whoever they know that might utilize me for their help. Well, you're a very unique person and you bring strengths from both of your parents, from your experience, and from having a good heart and wanting to see everybody succeed. And I, I admire that, so hats off to you. Thank you. I, I've not always done well for myself financially because I've taken financial losses and losing residuals along the way. But I, in my heart, I feel I've always done the right thing for the people. I can see that. Good for you, and good for you. Thank you. Thank you for listening.